us online. Also, happy Sunday. It's good to be with you digitally. Uh, uh, as I would normally say, check out your options online. There's our study guide. It's something that we help, helps us delve further into what we're studying every week. And our bulletin and uh, sermon notes are all available there as well. Our call to worship this morning is from Joel, chapter 2. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing fruit. The fig tree and the vine yet yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The, the threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. We will sing and sing and sing. And I'm so excited. Let's do that right now. Please stand and sing number 27 in the red hymnal. I, I sing the mighty power of God. Sing the goodness of the Lord. 
we have much to be grateful for from this week. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Dory. I'm the Director of Children's Ministries here at Bethesda. And that means that this past week I had the honor of working with an amazing team of volunteers and a phenomenal group of kids as we had a wonderful week at Vacation Bible School. I know several of you were able to join us for one of our meals or activities and many of you were praying for us and I just want to thank you for that. We spent the week thinking about and exploring truths about God, that he created us out of his love, that he died and lives for us, that he chooses to use people to do his work and invites us into that, that he calls us to follow him. And then we thought about how those truths about God impact how we understand ourselves and our relationship with him, that we are loved, we are redeemed, and we can respond to his invitation to trust him and to love others. We also spent a lot of time learning the stories of many of our cross-cultural families from Lutheran Brethren International Missions. You saw some of them referenced in the video, um, and that was a wonderful time to learn how some people have chosen to respond to God's love in a very specific, very sacrificial way. Um, and we had a chance to think about how we might respond to God's love in our every, every day, every moment here in the Chippewa Valley, uh, today, tomorrow, and in the future. So where do we take this from here? Um, I like to offer a few different options for our church family as we continue to bask in these truths of who God is and that we are his beloved. Um, Pastor Kirk will be unpacking some of those truths in the sermon this morning. There are, on the Welcome Center, there will be an overview of the Bible stories and the topics that we covered this week, if you're interested in taking one of those home. Each week, we offer a study guide to go with the sermon, and this week's study guide in the resource section um, has a link to the children's ministry page on our website, which features all five videos that we shared this week. There's one that's an overview of what it means to be a cross-cultural worker, and it includes greetings from several cross-cultural workers from eight different, uh, eight of the 11 LBI families that, um, that we know and support in prayer and through finances, with greetings specifically to us as a Bethesda family. Um, there's one that talks about language studies and features the Rose family with footage that they sent just to us. There's one that um, is about a playground project in Japan. Some of you may have seen that in worship earlier this spring. There's a video about what it means to be on home assignment and includes an interview with the Nathaniel Zabodi family. And then there's a video that tells part of the story of the Wen family, who are cross-cultural workers from Taiwan, sent by the Chinese Lutheran Brethren Church to Chad, where they are partnering with LBIM. And that's a really exciting story. And if you take a look at our exhibits during the community lifetime, you will see another Taiwanese family who is preparing to move to France in the coming months to do language studies, and will then be joining the Wens in Chad in 2024. Um, also on that resource section of the study guide are links to the songs that we use this week. That can be a great way to just bask in the truths of who God is and what he says about us. Um, and if you are interested during community life, there's a scavenger hunt in our exhibits. There are three different versions. There's a preschool version, a primary version, and a challenge version. Um, so I'll let you decide which one you want. I did overhear Pastor Brian thinking about moving something so that it might be hard to find. So if you're having a hard time, I'll be out there if you want some tips. If I can't find it either, then we'll just find Pastor Brian. So. Um, if you are interested in a specific tangible way of giving right now, our missions project for Vacation Bible School this week was collecting money to give to Dave and Sonia Narvison as they care for the children in Doe, as well as backpacks for the children here in Eau Claire as we partner with We Care Eau Claire. And there's the option to give a new backpack or to give money for new backpacks. So you can give online. Um, you can give here. If you're writing a check, make sure you put in the memo line what it's going towards. That's a very specific um, offering or, or, or dedicated purpose that we are uh, um, raising money for. But I want you to know that the money that was spent to make that really fun Rice Krispie Sushi, to buy the paper to make the flags, to buy the wristbands that the kids wore during the week so we would know what group they were in, 
to pay for the air conditioning that we were incredibly grateful for this week. That all comes from our general operating budget, and that is supported by the financial gifts that you all give um, throughout the year. So we never want people to give out of a sense of guilt, and if you are visiting with us this morning, we hope that you just enjoy being our guest. This is not directed towards you. But if you haven't considered giving financially before, I really encourage you to, to think about what that might be, to pray about. We talked this week about God helping our hearts and our heads to understand what he is inviting us into. And I encourage you to, to seek God in that and to see if he is inviting you into supporting his work as we support these cross-cultural workers and as we learn um, and discover together. So let's pray. Lord God, we come to you with great joy and gratitude, so thankful that you are God, that you created us, that you love us, that you love the people of the world. Lord, thank you that we could learn more about who you are by learning about cultures so different than our own, as well as by learning your stories from your word. And Lord, as we go into this week and into the weeks and months ahead, we pray that you would continue to teach us what it means to trust you and to love others. Lord, we bring to you our gifts of time and energy and money and thought and ideas. We give them to you with open hands, and we ask that you take them and multiply them in ways that we cannot imagine. Lord, teach our hearts this morning as we continue to praise you and as we listen to your word. In your name, amen. This week, we learned some new words to an old hymn, O oh, For a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I know there are a few kids and a few leaders from VBS out there. If you want to come up and help, I'm going to stand up here and do the motions while Aaron leads us in this song. We kind of tweaked the first verse and the fourth verse, and then we added two verses specific to our content this year. So we would love to sing it with you. We would love to have you stand and sing with us. The words will be on the screen as we join thousands of tongues around the world praising our Redeemer. I see we have some people coming up. I want to give you some time. It's okay. You match in everything? That's fantastic. Thank you. For a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of our God and King The triumphs of His grace He called us all to follow Him No matter where we live To trust Him and love others well by the grace he freely gave so come on and sing out let our anthem grow now there is one great love jesus from god's unending Boundless love, He created you and me. He made us not to be alone, but be in community. Our faithful God, our loving God, assists us to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of your name. So come on and sing, out let our anthem grow, now there is one great love. So come on and sing, out let our anthem grow, now there is one Thank you, guys.
The song repeats again and again this song that is woven throughout a classic story. It's actually, the story takes place actually in France. It ends in Paris. And it's a story that many of us have seen in film or in book form. And it's the story by Victor Hugo called Les Miserables. How many of you read that story or watched the movie? It's a famous story of cat and mouse, if you would, about a ex-convict by the name of Jean Valjean, prisoner 24601, and an inspector by the name of Inspector Javert. And they run over, they run after each other, or ins the inspector runs after Jean Valjean for decades and decades. And within that story, there's another story that's even bigger, and that's Jean Valjean becomes an adoptive father to a woman who passed away much too quickly. He raises a little girl, and there's a love story that's involved. And then it's even bigger than that, and that it's set years after the French Revolution, and that there's a generation that's coming and wanting things to be better for their generation, and this Les Miserables has at its very core, who am I? The soundtrack repeats again and again this, this question, who am I? And the main character, Jean Valjean, says, am I really a prisoner, 24601, or am I a redeemed man by the name of Jean Valjean? And in a powerful illustration of forgiveness and atonement, the narrative changes. The narrative changes when a French priest treats Jean Valjean in a unique way. You see, prisoner 24601 had been in prison for stealing bread for five years and then got an extra 14 years because he tried to run away. He broke his parole. After being released after 19 years, he was supposed to check in prisoner 24601 to different stations and he didn't, he couldn't find a place to sleep and so he finds a Catholic monastery, a convent. And there in the Catholic convent, he's given wine to be refreshed and food to be nurtured and he sees where they put the silver. He steals the silver. That night he steals the silver and he runs. He's a criminal. He's caught. It certainly means that he will go back into prisons and into chains. But then something happens with the Catholic priest. The Catholic priest makes a statement, a beautiful sign of atonement and forgiveness, and it changes the narrative for this man forever. The Catholic priest says this, forget not, never forget that you have promised to use the silver to become an honest man. He could have said, yes, he stole it from me. He chose not to do that. He said this, John Valjean, my brother, you belong no longer to evil but to good. It is your soul that I'm buying for you. I withdraw it from dark thoughts and from the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. And the man was treated in a way that he does not deserve. That exchange, that act of forgiveness, that covering, that atone, atoning for changes a man's life and the rest of the story. The power, the change that God does when he shows his love for us, through his love, because of his love, for the sake of his love, changes everything and it abounds in the Godhead. It abounds in nature. It abounds in people. The psalm that we're going to take a look at from Psalm 65 says this, when we were overwhelmed or sin prevailed over us. The word for sin means guilt, punishment, self-talk, shame. When we were overwhelmed by that, you forgave, or the true translation from the ESV means you atoned for our transgressions. That means our rebellion, knowingly, knowingly turning our back to God. When we were in the wrong, God poured out his grace and mercy. And the third verse of Psalm 65 is the reason to praise him, is the reason to applaud, to thank God, to worship him. If we confess our sins and turn from them, we are covered. We are good with the Almighty God. The one distinction of Christianity, apart from all religions, is this. Our faith is in the mediator. It's the one who gave his life for mine and for yours. We are never worthy of that. 
We never earn that. We never work hard enough for that. What Christ has done is all a gift. What he did and why he did that is because he loves us and we respond in praise because of his bounty and it abounds again and again. Tim Keller, the great pastor from New York, many of us have been blessed with him, tells a story in just a small way of this atonement. He tells of a TV detective show that he watched. It was the story of an old man who was in his 80s, an ex-Marine. He was sadly broken and he was accused of a crime. And because of that crime, two big strapping military police and a snarling Navy lawyer came to arrest the old man. They spoke, they spoke strongly against him, barking orders, when suddenly the old man's friend reached over and pulled away his tie. Underneath his tie revealed the Congressional Medal of Honor, which he had won decades before at Iwo Jima. At the sight of that medal, the lawyer and the MP snapped suddenly to attention, and they were not saluting him, of course. In himself, he was a criminal. But for the sake of the medal, which represented not only his sacrificial deeds, but the valor of hundreds of others in military services over the years. The man was treated with honor. Just a small way of what Christ's obedience splashes on us. This message is entitled, from Psalm 65, Bounty Abounds. And we see that bounty that abounds in forgiveness Underneath all psalms are several different clues and several different gems. In fact, psalms is best classified as poetry. There's five poetry books in the Bible. Psalms and Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Job, and one more that I forgot, but look it up. And in any good poetry, if you were to read letters between people who love each other, if you know that they love each other, that fills in the gap. And in this poetry, there are some gems that you can see, and you see them in this psalm. And so the first thing that we're going to see in this psalm, in the first four verses, is the messianic promise right there, the one who forgave us, kind of a hint. The second clue that you find in this psalm is another gem. And the psalm tells us that God's hope is for the world. Psalm, 4, verse, Psalm 65, verse 5 will say, this atonement, this covering, this bounty is for the ends of the earth. That's their hope, filled with awesome deeds. It's what our children learn. And finally, the psalm wraps up with one more gem, one more clue that you see in the poetry books, and that is this. Psalms calls us to praise him. Psalms cause us to reflect on his sovereign glory. To say, wow, that, that's what you're like? How can I not praise you and, and worship you? I want to invite you to turn to your Bibles to page 495, Psalm 65. If you have your own Bible, I want to give you just a few minutes to take a look at. Later in the message, as we take a look at this, you're going to do some circling of some words. I'm just giving you a fair warning because your hand's going to cramp when I show you a repeated word again and again and again. Page 495. Did you find a copy to follow along? Reading in Jesus' name. This is a psalm of David for the director of music, a song, poetry. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. For you, you who answer prayers, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those who choose and bring near to live in your court. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grains so that you have ordained it. 
You drench its furrows. You level its ridges. You soften it with showers. You bless its crops. You crown the year <clears throat> with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks. And the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Wow! His bounty abounds. I want to lead us in this prayer. This came across my desk by author Scotty Smith. Many of us enjoy his readings. Many of us enjoy his, his devotions. This one came called Heavenward. And I thought, you know what? This fits for us. We may read God's word and we may say, I am tired. I am weary. I need to hear good news. So let me read this prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your gracious invitation and command in Matthew 11:28 that says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In so many stretches of life, we are desperate for that. We have a nice little day pack that morphs into a Mount Everest backpack. Oftentimes, too much, we put that on me, literally. Other times, a convergence of circumstances and old wounds, people needs, and unforeseen events demand more energy, mental focus, and emotional bandwidth than we have. But you say in Matthew 11, 29 through 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, when we are weary and overwhelmed, thanks for not starting with a lecture time management. That might come later, but you always meet us with a gentle and humble heart. Always. Thank you. Here is where faith and grace kiss when we are overburdened. You tell us to pick something else up. Your yoke in your light burden. We've never really noticed it, but it makes sense. To take up your light burden, we have to off-burden ourselves of things you never intended us to carry. Your good friend Peter said, cast your cares and anxieties on you, Jesus, because you really care for us. We can't be anyone's savior, our children's or anyone else's. That's all on you, literally. And we can't let others keep loading us down with their baggage, the stuff they must learn to bring to you. You haven't called any of us to be the bullseye for other people's target practice, the pack meal for their anger, or the three-wish genie of their happiness. We must stop filling our expandable backpacks and rucksacks with old regrets and the burden of shame. It will cripple us. You've already borne our guilt and shame. Why would we grab that stuff back? If thoughts could be weighed, trying to carry double our body weight in worrisome contemplation, fearful ponderings, and 50-pound bags of what if. Lord, do I need to finish that sentence? You know what's on my heart. So King Jesus, what is your yoke and light burden? It is the gospel. To be yoked to you is to realize you fully carry us, not just our burdens. You are our righteousness, you are our hope, you are our peace, all the way home. So we sing Alleluia. We ask that you would help our unbelief. In the coming minutes that we are in this place, I pray that you would breathe on us by your spirit with fresh freedom. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the King, the Ruler, the one who will come again, the one who rescues us. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Once again, I want to invite you to find a bulletin and uh, follow along on the bulletin insert that's on the back. And you may want to fill in and go back and study again. And if you're watching online, as Aaron said, we're so glad that you're here. Why don't you wave? There you go. I see you. And you can uh, download a bulletin insert as well, too. Here's the first thing that I referenced already, that bounty abounds rooted in forgiveness and grace abounding with no limits. We see forgiveness in the person of Jesus Christ and his beautiful completion of all the Old Testament sacrifices. We see this again and again and again. In fact, we sing, 
we sing a song that talks about grace that abounds with no limits, bountiful grace. It goes like this, unending grace, free grace, outpouring grace, 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 God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse with sin, grace, grace, God's grace. And the last line of the song, I think it goes like this, greater than a few of my sins. Uh, Not some sins. Even those kinds of sins. That's not how the song goes. It goes, grace greater than all our sins. The Old Testament and the atonement found in the Old Testament and the forgiveness of sins was placed in Old Testament sacrifices. When someone would take a lamb, they would put their hands on it, and scholars say that that was a way that the sinner would identify with the animal to be sacrificed. Then, in that Old Testament sacrifice, and you read this throughout the Old Testament, and oftentimes people say, there's so much blood, there's so much sacrifice, there's so much killing. What's that all about? Well, the person laying their hands on the animal would then put their hand to their neck as if to repeat and to say, what's going to happen to this animal is going to happen to me, or what should happen to me. I deserve to die. And then Christ steps on the scene as we've been walking through the book of Hebrews this winter and last fall. We find that Christ himself is the great high priest. The word high priest in Latin means pontificate or bridge builder. And so Christ, Christ pays the penalty for our sin again and again and again. And God is satisfied with that. The reformer shortened all of that teaching to this, grace alone, Christ alone, the word alone, and faith alone, and to God's glory alone. Jesus' good friend, and John puts it this way, I invite you to turn to page 911 in John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, and the opening of John's gospel kind of frames the ministry of Jesus. There's so much good stuff in John chapter 1. If you want a spiritual challenge for this summer, memorize John 1, just the whole chapter. But in verses 12 through 13, it gives us this insight on page 911. It gives us this insight of God's atonement and grace found to us in Christ with us abounding this free gift invitation. Listen to what it says in verse 12 through 13. Did you find it there? It says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or husband will, but born of God. Wow. What a gracious invitation. His bounty abounds, it atones, it forgives, it covers our sin. This is good news to share. And that ties in right to the second part of the, of the psalm that we read, that this bounty abounds and it drips with awesome deeds and hope abounds to all nations. Let me repeat that. Bounty dripping with awesome deeds, says the scriptures. And that hope abounds to all nations. What are those awesome deeds? Well, immediately we think of creation, which is true. And creativity and mountains and oceans. I have a good friend right now who's traveling national forests and parks. And maybe you're listening on the radio, you're up at your cabin, or you're out at the lake, and you say, these are some of the awesome deeds that God has done. I wouldn't argue with that. But John chapter 1, verse 12 through 13 gives us a hint of what those awesome deeds are. And it's changed lives of people who were once not followers of Christ and now are followers of Christ. So let me give you an illustration and explain this awesome deeds. One of my Christian heroes or people that I look up to that I've learned a lot from is a man by the name of Chuck Colson. And he passed away 10 years ago. He was the founder of Prison Fellowship, a ministry that my wife and I have supported for many, many years. Chuck Colson came on the national radar, if you will, as a 37, 38-year-old young lawyer 
who had an office next to the President of the United States, President Nixon. Some of you know this story, some of you don't, so just bear with me. Colson got indicted because of the Watergate scandal. And as an empty man who had all the power in the world, he went from an office knowing the most powerful person in the world in the White House to knowing criminals in prison. He was indicted. He was given one to three years in prison. And in that period of time, he became a Christian. Well, how do you think the media responded to that? They mocked him. They had political cartoons, all kinds of satire. He served a time in prison, but when he was in prison, after he was released, he couldn't get out of his mind the men that he had met in prison. And so he committed his life to shepherding and encouraging and developing a ministry. In fact, until his dying day, every Easter he would spend in prison with other men. Well, Prison Fellowship, after 10 years, did a tribute to their video, and as I watched it, it ended with this statement by his daughter, Emily. She said, people often ask me, what's it like to be the daughter of Chuck Colson? She said, two pictures that I have in my office remind me of my dad. The first picture is in the Oval Office, neck in the room with the most powerful man in the world, President Nixon, and there's my dad. The second picture I have of my dad is the same room in the Oval Office with George W. Bush. And I look at my dad and say, he's a redeemed man. He's a changed man. That is awesome indeed. God changes lives, and we need to realize that. This call, that is the hope of the nation, and it shifts our focus. Listen clearly. Listen, church. It shifts our focus from natural self-focus, natural narcissism, to other people focused because of his bountiful deeds. It is the hope to the ends of the earth. It is what God is doing in people's lives around the world. This is what we studied. This is what we sang. This is what we proclaimed. Is this not true? This is what we talked to our children all this week. Our verse came from Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. I'll invite you to read with me in just a second. It says this, Then I looked, and there stood before me was the Lamb, standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a peal of thunder. The sound heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000, those who had been redeemed from the earth. And these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouth, and they are blameless. Verse 6, And then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. And this is what the angel said. Do you want to read it with me? Good news to proclaim to those who live on earth and to every nation and tribe and language and people. What a powerful word that is. When Dory introduced the song, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, it was pretty neat. She said, Pastor Kirk, we, I wrote an extra verse for that. I said, you did? It was really good. And this was the verse that she, that she uh, wrote and that we sang. From his unending, boundless love, he created you and me. He made us not to be alone, but live in community. What she didn't do, that we did as a group, was the sign language for the word created. You ready? It's really neat. This is what God did. It's sign language. You put your thumb to your head, and then you wiggle out. You put your thumb to your head, and you wiggle out all the ways that God is doing new things in people's lives that we may not see, but he does. Amen?
We must prepare our hearts for the rich diversity of heaven by showing love for all, especially those of God's people on earth who are far from us socially, economically, racially, politically, or any other way. Why? Because Jesus unifies us. Remember, one of the hidden gems in this poetry book is not only the messianic promise that his bounty abounds and forgives, but the bounty that God wants to redeem all people. You can't miss this, what God is doing supernaturally. In fact, if you go back to Psalm 65, I told you your hand would cramp. There's this little clue of a repeated word. Now, I know I make a big deal about repeated words. Here's the reason why. I want things sometimes really simple. And so the author, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, for sure, the way they emphasize something to get your attention is repeating a word again and again and again. And if you look at Psalm 65, 13 verses, 21 times this word is repeated. You your or yourself. Look at all of them. Just take a minute. Take a look at them. Here, can you see in my Bible? Oh, you can't see that, sorry. It's just circled all over the place. What God has done in his awesome deeds. And this is the third gem. The third gem of his bounty abounds is that we praise him. We praise him because of his visit and we praise him because his bounty abounds. Verse 10 says, when all is done and the faithfulness, the fruitfulness of the earth is seen, it must not be ascribed to the rain or sun or any other secondary cause, but the blessings belong to God and God alone. Look at the verbs in verse 10. Look at them. Drench, level, soften, bless. By this description, God shows that the order of nature is a testimony of God's love toward us. We learn a few cues from nature itself, most certainly. One of my favorite verses is from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. On page 966, it says this, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's not my favorite part. But this, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world's God's invisible power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. They're without excuse. No excuse. The best way that I can illustrate that for you or explain that for you is by sharing with you an example that I learned when I was in seminary. My professor said, Martin Luther has said that the best evidence for God is the footprints that he leaves behind. The footprints that he leaves behind. What are those footprints? One of those footprints is the constant question every generation asks called what is true? How do we know what's true? It's called the epistemological question. The second footprint that happens in people's human heart is the footprint of moral right and moral wrong. How come in, certain, in almost every culture there are certain things that are over the line? Who put that footprint there? Another footprint is cosmology, cosmological question. Where did the world come from? People have asked that question all the time. Who put that question there? But this particular verse that we just read is creation, the testimony of creation, the power of creation. When people go to natural, national parks and go, wow, this is incredible. Look at the sunrise. This is unbelievable. That's God's incredible footprint. But there's a better footprint. Have you ever gotten something, uh, a, a rock in your shoe before? Julie and I are walking more and more and more, enjoying these days. And sometimes I get a rock in my shoe. And I'll just say, just a second. You take off your shoe. You pull out the rock. In all those footprints, there's one more footprint that's even more clear. And that's this. 
You can't get away from this. It's the power of the cross. It's the power of the cross. In verse, what is it? Verse 9, the word you care for the land and water it, the King James and the ESV has a better word for that, a more accurate word for that, and that is this, you visited. Has God ever visited the world? Has God ever come in and taken, taken on flesh? He sure has. His name's Emmanuel. Magi from the east came and presented their gifts to him. Mary was overwhelmed when she heard the news. Old man Simeon said, now I can go. I have seen the glory of God. The prophets prophesied that there would be a visit. There was a visit, and that changed everything. Everything. That's what we testify to. So we ask these questions. What will it look like to praise our glorious Lord this week in your life? How will that play out? What song will you sing him? Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Or God's grace upon grace. The second question is this. Who this week will you pray for? Who will you speak to? Who will you cause a spark for the gospel? Who will you fast and pray for, I ask? Those who are the hope of the nations. The hope of of the end of the world, those people who live on earth and every nation and tribe and language and people. And finally this, why does knowing our planet was visited matter in your life and those you love? It's not pretend. He's coming back. He could come back next Sunday. And if we are, no church. Just saying. Why does this matter? Here's why it matters. In light of all that's taken place this week in national news, there is a report that came out that might just kind of fall by the way, radar, fall off to the side and no one pay attention to. There was, a, there was a survey that was done by Gallup in May of 2020, just 2022, just last week, and it found out that 81% of Americans believe in God. And you may think that's pretty good, but in the 1950s, it was 98%. Now, you may think, well, that's still not too bad. This is the part that breaks my heart. If you have children or nieces or nephews or grandchildren or the next generation, only 68% of young adults believe in God. Think that'll go up or down? Probably down. Those that believe in God, the 81%, only 42% believe that God actually answers prayers and listens. That's the people who believe in God. So who am I? Jean Valjean asks us, who am I? I'm a man that's been forgiven. What's your testimony? Who am I? I'm one who lives on mission that when we leave these doors and we scatter, whether it's restaurants or places of work or our neighborhoods or our jobs or it's our relationships, we ask, Lord, how would you use my witness? Who am I? I'm joining creation and praising him. I'm joining creation and praising him because I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for the power of this word. Thank you for laying this on David's heart. Thank you for this song. Thank you for this beautiful work of poetry. Thank you that your bounty abounds again and again and again, and we get to be recipients of that. So thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We have one more song to sing. Number 34 in the red hymnal, stand with us and sing Immortal Invisible.
God be the glory. Say, we want to invite you to just stick around and enjoy our community life hour. Head to the fellowship hall. I love what Dory said. There's a scavenger hunt. So we're not going to put an age limit on that. Uh, So if you want to take part in that, uh, please do. And if you see Dory, thank her. We had a powerful, powerful week. It was a powerful week of ministry. What a joy to partner with this gifted woman of God. We have a gift in her. Let me just tell you that. Receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his wonderful and supernatural peace. In the name of the Father who loves you so much, who's filled with glory, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who visited and will come again, and the Holy Spirit, who whispers and says, it's all true. We gotta share this. Amen and amen. Thanks for coming.